In this video, we'll take a look at how to load in VDB caches as animated sparse volume textures with Unreal 5.3. We will also take a look at how to create a material to allow us to remap our density and temperature range in our volumes as well. We will also add controls for adjusting the density and temperature, intensity, and color. We'll start off with a brand new scene and we'll go to the content browser and go to right click import. Here you can import your VDB caches. And if you are part of the Patreon, which you can find in the description below, you'll also get access to these eight uh, volume caches that you can test this out with in Unreal. So you'll be able to download all these. And these are optimized and fairly low quality-ish for Unreal, so they play back fairly quickly. They have the velocities removed. They only have the data that they really need stored. So they do play back at an okay speed in Unreal and uh, don't get too slow. So you'll be able to download these eight caches if you are part of the Patreon. Once you've selected a VDB cache, you'll see this pop-up open up that shows you what you're importing. So I can see where my VDB cache is located. I can see that it's importing a sequence and found 120 frames or 120 files. We also see the data that's importing, which is stored in attributes A and B. This will be useful for accessing them through the material. So we can see here, it's not importing anything but density in the red channel. Usually density will be in the red channel and the green channel is usually temperature. Now we can also see at the bottom the resolution of the VDB cache. It's 55 by 55 by 72 voxels. Generally when importing VDBs into Unreal, you want to keep the voxel size smaller as well as strip out any, any data that you don't need such as velocities because Unreal doesn't really seem to use those and by Taking that data away, it'll make the file size much smaller, so it'll play back much quicker and much more efficiently in Unreal. So you don't want to be importing really heavy volume caches into Unreal. You probably won't get good performance out of it. So I generally try to load in, as you can see here, a proxy or a low quality version of the volume cache that I have. So once we've kind of confirmed this information and we see what we're importing and that all looks good, we can click import and it will import our VDB as an animated sparse volume texture type in Unreal. And now we have our cache here accessible to add into our uh, volume volumes and play them back in our viewport. Now one other thing we want to keep in mind is if you double click on these volume caches, you do have options here to change the tiling. Sometimes you might see some artifacts where at the top of the volume cache and playing back it might flicker or pop. If you see that problem, you could set these to clamp and that will make sure that the cache does not get tiled or mirrored and it might get rid of some data that might flow over or kind of leak into the, the voxels or part of the simulation that it shouldn't. So generally I find sometimes setting that to clamp can reduce some artifacts or problems you might experience. So now that we have our VDB caches inside of Unreal as these animated sparse volume textures, let's take a look at how we can actually apply them to a volume and then set up a material to adjust their color, intensities, and ranges. So to get one of our sparse volume textures or VDB caches to show up in our viewport, we're going to have to create a volume. So I'm going to click up here on this plus and I'm going to search for a heterogeneous volume and we'll create this heterogeneous volume bounds and we can just place that anywhere in our scene. But this won't be able to take a sparse volume texture or a VDB cache, it actually takes a material. So we have to make a material that loads in our sparse volume texture. So I'm gonna create a new folder called materials and we're gonna create a material that we can reuse and kind of use for all of our, our volume caches. So I'm just gonna create a brand new material and call it M underscore animated SVT underscore base and we'll open up that material. Now that material cannot be a surface. We have to change it to be a volume. We have to change the blend mode to additive because volume materials must use an additive blend mode. And then what we can do is load our sparse volume texture by right clicking and creating a sparse volume texture sample parameter node. I'm just gonna call this volume texture for now. 
and then I'm going to load in one of the sparse volume textures I have as an example, as something that we can test with. So I'll click down and I'll just use maybe this torch uh, sparse volume texture. And after we've done that, we have to determine how that volume texture is mapped on this volume box that the material will kind of be applied to. So we have to set up the UVs uh, for this sparse volume texture. And to do that, we have to get the local position and then subtract from it our object local bounds. And we'll use the minimum. So we'll subtract the minimum and then divide by the extents. And that's really it. And that will map our our volume texture properly to this volume box uh, when this material is applied to that volume box. So if we do all this and we connect our attributes A to Albedo or something and save this, you think this might work, but it won't. If we go in here and take our heterogeneous volume, apply this material to it, we just get a box, a solid box. And the reason for this is we have to connect up some things like extinction, but we also have to connect up what our volume cache has for certain uh, parameters or certain grids inside of it. So what I mean by that is if I just re-import this torch sparse volume texture that I'm just going to do now to kind of show as an example what data it contains, we see that in the red channel it contains density, in the green channel it contains temperature on our attributes A. So that's important to take note of because that's how I'm going to be able to access the density and the temperature from this volume cache or from this volume texture in our material. In attributes A in the red channel I have density and attributes A in the green channel I have temperature. So knowing that now I can go back into my material. I'm going to take that attributes A and we're going to pretty much extract or just mask out our red channel. So I'm just going to do a component mask. I'm only going to mask out the red channel and I'm going to connect that to the color or the albedo as well as the extinction. And that's density. So now where it's not dense it will remove the volume. Where it is dense we'll have a volume. So now I have a network that looks like this and if we save that and take a look at what we got now. Now we start to see our volume. It looks a little bit squished and this sometimes happens depending on the the resolution of the volume. So I'm just going to stretch that out for now. And then we'll click on our heterogeneous volume component here and I'll turn on animate so it plays and animates and we'll start getting our animated volume. Now if you see the volume going blurry like this there's a couple things that this could mean. One, it's too heavy to load and keep up with a quick pace. So you're only going to get to load when you pause it. Or two, your hard drive write speed is not fast enough. Right now I'm reading this uh, volume cache off a external drive, which is not an SSD and that's going to have a little bit of a problem. So if you swap it onto a drive that's faster, that is a solid state drive, or that has a faster write speed, you'll most likely get better playback as well. So if you are using heavier volume caches, if you are doing something for a cinematic short, you're going to have to have fairly quick read and write speeds if you want to see heavier caches being played back in real time without going blurry. So I'm going to transfer these caches onto uh, my local drive, my solid state drive, and then I'll reload it and uh, we'll take a look at how that plays. So now I have this re-imported from my local drive and if I were to play it now, no problems, super smooth. So just keep that in mind. Uh, these these kind of things, these sparse volume textures with, with heavier caches are going to be a bit problematic to play back if you're using ones that are film quality. You want to make sure you keep them optimized. The ones I do provide on the Patreon are fairly optimized and I'm keeping the frames to much lower file sizes.
So now that we have this all working, we need to find a way to change how this volume looks. It doesn't look bad right now, but we don't see the fire. And I know that this has temperature included as well. It's not just density, it's not just smoke, it also has temperature. So we want some controls to be able to adjust that. The look of the temperature, the brightness of the temperature, how much temperature is mapped out over this uh, kind of area of this volume as well as control over the density. Maybe I don't like the color of the smoke, maybe I want it to be a different color. So we wanna be able to have control over adjusting those types of things. So I'm gonna go back into the material and we're gonna start adding the ability to have those adjustments. And it's fairly easy to do this once you kind of get the hang of it. What I'm setting up here is not gonna be the perfect example of it, but it'll get something that can be reusable that can kind of get you moving and, and make your own kind of setups if you want as well. So we know that the red channel is density, the green channel is going to be temperature. So let's try a test here. I'm gonna mask out another component. So component mask, I'm gonna mask out temperature, so green channel. And we're gonna connect that to emissive color. So illumination or self-illumination. And we'll save that and see what happens. So if we do that, okay, everything is super, super bright, like nuclear. And this again is a bit of a problem. Now I can multiply that, bring that down, and maybe it becomes a bit more visible, but that's not necessarily what we're gonna want to do at this point. So what we're gonna try doing first is we're going to add a, another node that will take this temperature value because right now in this VDB or in this volume cache the temperature is probably stored as like a heat value and maybe if it's like 5,000 degrees or something or 800 degrees that mapped to a color is just 800 super bright because one is is white two is brighter and three is even brighter so these temperature values are not mapping to our emissive color correctly right now so what I can do is I can create a black body utility node and this black body utility node uh, if I go into the extra explanation here it will take the user inputs of a temperature in Kelvin and return the color and intensity which can be used to drive the base color and emissive values to get a physically accurate result so if I have the temperature stored in the volume cache, I'm gonna take that, connect it to this black body utility node, connect that to my albedo, the color of the uh, volume or the density, and then also the self-illumination of the volume. And if we do that, now we get something that looks a bit better. Okay, now it starts to look a little bit more like a fire. Now what we can also do, and I'm just going to pause this for now. It's going to be a little bit more chattery because I'm also recording this. So it's probably not going to read and write as quick as it should. But now that we have this, we can start adding other controls because this still doesn't look good. So the way those temperature values and those density values are mapped is going to be something that we want control over as well. Like we were, we're going to be wanting able to have the control to say cut off any density values uh, below 10% density or below 30% density. We want to have the control to clip and modify our temperature or density in whatever way we want to adjust it. So we'll change this a bit more to have that control. So to set that up at first, what I'm going to do is use a remap and we'll start off with maybe our density only. So I'm just going to delete this other stuff away and we'll do this one by one. I'm going to take a remap value range node so I could take an input and then take the low value and remap it to a new target low value and take a high value and remap it to a new target high value. So it's just remapping numbers. You can remap zero to be one and one to be 0.5. You, could, you can do anything. You're just remapping the minimum and maximum point. So I'll take the 
red channel output here. And maybe I'll place this like this, try to get a nice overview of the whole material. And what we'll do is we'll create some inputs for these. So input low by default, we create a constant and connect it up, but another thing you can do will just be going here and right clicking on these little pins and going promote to parameter. And then we'll get this little parameter and I'll just set it to density, density low, or maybe density, input density low. And that can just be zero. And then we'll promote to parameter input density high. And that'll be one. So that'll be the default values. And then we can remap it to whatever we want. For now, we'll just leave it the default zero for the target density low and one for the target density high. So it doesn't do anything, but we'll have the ability to remap it. So there we go. So now we have all those set up. Our output or our result will also take out and we'll add a multiply. So we have the ability to change the strength of our density. And what I'll end up doing here is just create another, maybe a constant and just call it, uh, we'll convert to a parameter and call it a density multiplier. And leave it at one by default and connect that to our extinction like that. And if we save this, just as an example, so now if we instance our material, so right click, create material instance, and apply that to our heterogeneous volume, we get our smoke showing up. And if we open up our instanced material, we have those options that we created. So we got our density multiplier, input density high, input density low, target density high, target density low. If nothing's showing up, make sure it's uh, set to the right values. Like make sure your high isn't set accidentally to, you know, see if you set to zero what happens or if your input density or target density low or something is, is set differently, it's gonna change drastically the way your volume looks. So you always want to make sure low is zero, high is one by default. And uh, you can just go into your material and double check, make sure that it's low zero, high one, low zero, high one, um, just to avoid any issues. Now, once we've confirmed that, we can easily just look at our material here on our, on our heterogeneous volume and we can have it play probably want to pause it while you're changing settings. Um, otherwise, you know, it might be heavy for it to load, especially now since I'm screen recording, it's not going to get the bandwidth it needs. So I'll have to stop its animation and I could change the density to be more dense or less dense. And then remapping, as I mentioned, it's not only about density, but if I want to clip things away sooner. So maybe I say uh, the input density high is one right now, but I'm going to clip it to only be 0.5 and then everything gets much thinner, 0.1 and that's super thin. So you can kind of change this or input density low, maybe by default it's uh, 0.2 and then we're clipping things away, 0.3, clipping them away even more, 0.1, not as much. So you're able to clip your volume cache uh, clip away larger values, clip away smaller values, and modify it a little bit. Now it would be nice to be able to change the color of this, so we're going to go back to our parent or base material, and we're going to take a look at how we can add some other controls as well to our material. So the next thing I'm going to do is we want to be able to change the color, but we want that color to be able to be based off the temperature or the actual heat of the volume or density, but we also want the ability to override it to whatever color we want. So I'm gonna create a static switch parameter. 
and that will allow me to have a true or false toggle and I'll call it override volume color and connect that to our albedo and if it's set to true we'll have a constant three vector to choose our very own color and I'll make that a parameter called volume color and by default maybe I'll just make it white or something and if we don't choose to override the volume color then it will go to false and that will use uh, the value from the, the temperature so we'll be able to have that control which means next we have to set up our temperature our remapping for our temperature and then also color overriding for our temperature as well so to do that, we're going to take attributes A, we're going to mask out, so mask component, the green channel, which is temperature. Same thing, we're going to create a remap value range. Take our input. Same thing, create parameters for low high input and low high target. So promote to parameter and I'll call it uh, input temperature low that's zero and then input high input temperature high that'll be set to one and then target low target temperature low and target temperature high and that'll be set to one so after that what we're going to want to do next is then have our ability to make the temperature higher or lower, like be able to multiply it. So I'm going to take a multiply right after this, kind of the same thing we did with our density, and I'll create a constant, convert that to a parameter, and make it our temperature intensity. And by default, they'll just be one, so it doesn't change. And then we'll connect that to our black body radiation utility, which will convert it from temperature degrees in Kelvin to the proper color values. And we can use that then for our color, for albedo, if we set it to false to override the volume color. And we can also set that to be our emissive color. But we want the ability to also be able to override our temperature color as well. If we don't want this to look like realistic fire, uh, maybe we want it to look like a blue fire or a green flame or something. So if that's the case, we have to make some modifications. We're going to have to make another switch. So static switch parameter. We'll call it uh, override temperature color. Connect that to our emissive color. And if we are overriding, if it's true, we'll connect it to our custom color. If it's false, it will go to our kind of black body radiation color. And for overriding our temperature, it's a little bit different. We can't just use a color because we want to get the, the values and the ranges um, from our, our temperature properly. So what, what I recommend to do that is to take our black body radiation value here, black body radiation output here, and do a cheap contrast node to make it grayscale, to make it black and white, and then multiply it by a color. So I'll take a cheap contrast node, and then multiply that by our color. And I'll create a constant three vector for our color. Our color will be a parameter called temperature color and I'll just make it by default maybe some orangish yellow or something and that will be if we override the temperature so that kind of ends up being our network I'm trying to fit it in here so everyone can see it um, but that is kind of our, our full network now and if we save this, let's test if it works. We didn't make any mistakes here. We can take a look at what we have. 
and we can try changing this, like make the temperature half as strong or a fraction of the strength. And this is all pretty cool. This is looking pretty good. Maybe I'll up the density a bit more so we see that smoke a bit more. Maybe clip the temperature a bit so maybe the the target uh, temperature high will be a bit less so we get some more smoke in there. And there we go. We have our our volume and we have the ability also to override the volume color and override the temperature color so I could turn those on and set the volume color to black or maybe I want it to be blue smoke and have uh, a light blue flame so I could change all those things as well and we can totally customize the look of this now so now you're able to go in here and make all kinds of different variations. You can just slide the parameters up and down and see kind of what works as well. You don't have to put too much thought into it if you're just trying to figure out what looks good. So it gives you a lot of flexibility to now change the colors and customize this any way you want. And you could probably take this a step further, but now you have an idea on how to modify and adjust those attributes that are attached to these volume caches and use them within a material and have some control over them. So you're not just stuck with the look you export, you're able to remap these values and get the most out of your volume caches. If you enjoyed this video, if you learned something new, don't forget to like, subscribe, and check out the Patreon if you're interested in getting some of these sample VDBs. Uh, they are included. Um, if you are part of the Patreon, you'll get this PDF that goes over everything we went over in this video, as well as these eight simple VDB examples that you can try out and use within your scenes. And if you're interested in creating your own VDBs or your own volume caches, you can really do that out of almost any software. You could do it out of Houdini, Blender, Maya. You can also create them from some other softwares that are a little bit more user friendly. I think one of the best softwares to create these VDB caches is Embergen, which is pretty easy to use and easy to export. Just keep in mind, try to keep your VDBs light. Don't put in information that you're not going to use, like velocities would be super important for if you're rendering them to get proper motion blur, but in Unreal you're not really going to get motion blur on your animated sparse volume texture. So you can leave out the velocities, it'll make the file sizes way lighter and have them run way quicker in your viewport. And don't forget to comment down below if you found this was useful and what other videos and what other content you'd also like to see.